our environmental coverage on this program has not yet uh, addressed the question of what is happening to the permafrost, that is uh, the layer of permanently or up to now permanently frozen material under the Earth's surface. But our next guest is doing very important research in that area. I became aware of her work through an article in the Washington Post and very much wanted to talk to her and introduce her work to, to our audience. Katie Walter Anthony is an aquatic ecosystem ecologist based in Alaska. Her research focuses on methane and carbon dioxide emissions from Arctic and temperate lakes and wasteland, or excuse me, wetlands in Alaska and Siberia. And through my reading on her research, I learned the word thermokarst, which means permafrost thaw, and uh, some of her findings have recently gotten some coverage and deservedly so. So first of all, uh, Katie, Walter, Anthony, thanks for coming on the program. You're welcome. It's my pleasure to talk with you today. And secondly, uh, the um, first of all, just since I am not qualified to describe it particularly, your work, I, as I understand it, centers on uh, primarily on permafrost, or certainly to a great extent. And did it, did I describe permafrost? reasonably accurately? Yes, uh, very accurately. It's, permafrost is ground that has been frozen for at least two consecutive years. So permanently is, <laughs> permanently is an interesting word. Um, the technical definition is any ground that's been frozen for at least two consecutive years. And it tends to be frozen much longer than that. <laughs> so, okay, and, and including, you know, potentially tens of thousands of years, right? Um, That's I, right, yeah. The oldest permafrost is uh, more than a million years old. Wow. But and it, uh, it, there's, permafrost has different ages. Some of, it, some of the permafrost is from the Little Ice Age, so it's only hundreds of years old. But much of uh, where we work, the permafrost is tens of thousands of years old. So the ground has been frozen for tens of thousands of years. Which I find absolutely fascinating, and I understand it can be, you know, nearly... Uh, 5,000 feet deep. So, you know, we're talking about uh, a long-standing and massive phenomenon, and it is beginning to, uh, at least in certain parts of the world, uh, decompose. Is that correct? That's right. Well, so we should also talk about what is in permafrost. Because permafrost is any ground that's been frozen, then a rock that's frozen could also technically be permafrost. What we're very concerned and interested in is frozen soil because soil contains the remains of dead plants and animals, plants and animals that lived at some point in the past, and then when they died, their, um, their remains became incorporated into soils that froze, that subsequently froze, and those soils have been frozen for, well, in this case, tens of thousands of years. So it's the organic carbon the um, dead plant and animal remains that have been frozen, which is really relevant to climate change today. So Now, permafrost thaw is not new. A, a, per, a permafrost... So, so permafrost thaw is not new. Even though okay. the... So when we measure the methane coming out of these lakes, it can be up to 40,000 years old. Uh, or if it's depending on the source, some of it's fossil methane coming from a geologic source. But this permafrost carbon, um, which is, yeah, I mean, they're, they're both important topics, but this permafrost carbon is, I think, what you were getting into. It, um, the, the animals and plants that died, died 40,000 years ago, <laughs> and they've, their remains have been frozen for 40,000 years. Today, that permafrost is thawing, and microbes are decomposing those frozen remains and generating greenhouse gases. But so, that process of thawing is not new. It's been going on for a long time. Is it uh, then what what is new? Is it the uh, is, is the process accelerating, or is something happening to the trend of this thawing that uh, that is of particular interest or concern? Well, that you're hitting on really good questions. Um, we have different tools in our toolbox to answer the question, is permafrost thaw accelerating? And one of the tools looks at paleoenvironmental records. Uh, 
And when we do that, we're very often looking at lake sediment cores. So when we look at the paleo record, we can see that permafrost has been thawing for um, about 10,000 years. And in fact, 10,000 years ago, it was thawing more than it is today. So this ancient methane source was a larger source. Emissions were even higher 10,000 years ago during what we call the Holocene Optimum. It subsequently slowed down um, as after the Holocene Optimum, the climate got cooler. And today it's actually a little cooler than it was in the Arctic. It's about one and a half degrees cooler than it was during the Holocene Optimum. But we are, if, if the modeling is correct for the future, for this century, we are standing on the doorstep right at the threshold of some abrupt change. And within the next 100 years, by 2100, the models suggest that the Arctic could become 7 to 8 degrees warmer than it is now. So that is very rapid warming compared to what the Earth experienced 10,000 years ago. And the models project that with that rapid warming this century, permafrost will thaw much faster than it ever has before. Is it happening now? It doesn't seem, we might, we're at the beginning of it probably, but we actually don't have the tools in our toolbox yet, um, or the analyses haven't been done to answer, is it accelerating? There are a few places where, where scientists have used satellite images to look at, we can, from satellite images and historical aerial photos, we can look at permafrost and see during the last 60 years, has it been accelerating? And in a few places it has been. But that type of high resolution, high temporal resolution analysis is missing. It's an area where we now need to start working. Um, but based on the paleo records and then the historical and satellite imagery, um, I, we cannot conclude that we have yet seen an acceleration today of permafrost law. But if we believe the models, it should start happening any moment. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of an exciting time to be in monitoring work. It's exciting. Uh, I, I might be uh, uh, worrisome too. Uh, um, and again, we're talking with Katie Walter Anthony, who is a scientist studying, uh, among other things, permafrost thaw. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Anthony, I'm not, um, you know, I'm new to the topic of perma of permafrost thaw. But when we've had people on talking about, for example, uh, oceanographic research, the issue has come up of uh, a kind of feedback loop process where, where uh, he, the heat uh, creates thermal changes in the ocean, which creates more heat, which accelerates the thermal changes you get in this accelerating loop. Uh, of change, and I'm sure I'm not describing it entirely appropriately from a scientific point of view, but that's the gist as I understand it. Are we looking at the potential for something like that happening with permafrost thaw as well? Yes, absolutely. So the permafrost soils contain about two times as much carbon as the atmosphere. So if all of the permafrost, uh, the carbon that's in permafrost were to thaw and decompose, and be released as carbon dioxide, it would about triple present-day atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Um, in fact, some of it, when it thaws, is released as methane, which is a stronger greenhouse gas. But by converting that soil carbon into greenhouse gases, those greenhouse gases are trapping the incom incoming solar radiation, causing the Earth's surface to warm, which in turn causes more permafrost to thaw, the release of more carbon to microbes that generate more greenhouse gases, and um, that is theoretically also a positive feedback loop. So uh, what I, if, I guess what we're looking at then is uh, what, what becomes critical, if I understand correctly, is the rate at which it's thawing, the rate at which it's decomposing and, and these greenhouse gases are being released into the atmosphere. If it's really slow, presumably we won't see much for a long time. If it's really fast, it could be, uh, the impact could be extreme and so on. So I is that a fair summary? That's, that's a very accurate summary, and that's what, that's, that's what was new in our recent uh, paper. Until now, all the Earth system models are not really incorporating the permafrost carbon feedback. Um, 
some some models that have started modeling permafrost carbon release are only looking at a process known as gradual thaw. And gradual thaw is the it affects the land surface, so we're not talking about lakes, we're talking about tundra and boreal forest that has permafrost beneath it. And every summer, the surface of the soil uh, where the vegetation is rooted, it thaws. And over the course of the summer, that thaw depth increases. And that's and then in the winter, that, that, that layer refreezes. So that's called the seasonal active layer. So the idea is that as we warm temperature, atmospheric temperatures in the future, that active layer will get thicker. But that's a gradual thaw process. And according to the models, we will not release vast amounts of permafrost carbon until well beyond the year 2100 if we're only looking at that gradual thaw process of active layer thickening. But we know from our work on lakes that ancient permafrost carbon is already being released as methane. And the reason is, is that when you have a lake, when, when standing water forms as permafrost starts to thaw, the, the, the frozen ground is contained, it consists of um, frozen soil and ice. And so when that ice melts, the ground surface collapses, and that hole or depression, if it fills with water, and then the water doesn't freeze to the bottom in winter, you can actually get thawing year-round. So the, the formation of a, what we call a thermokarst lake or a thaw lake, it accelerates permafrost thaw. And the permafrost thaws deep really fast, and also um, it, the lake expands laterally. So the formation of this thermokarst lake we call abrupt thaw because it's a very rapid thaw. And the deep, how deep it goes into the permafrost means it's tapping into really old carbon. So if this process of abrupt thaw were taken into account in the models, we would see much higher amounts of permafrost carbon released this century um, within my lifetime and my children's lifetime. So by the year 2060, for example, we would start to see peak emissions from this abrupt thaw process. So the, the main take-home point from our work so far is that it's really important that these Earth system models start to take into account abrupt thaw processes rather than treating all of the permafrost as a more homogenous, gradual thaw process. Well, it seems to me, Dr. Anthony, that the implications for this research are very, very significant. And even though I did see an article in the Washington Post, it seems to me uh, it should get a lot more attention than it does. Um, uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, you've published this paper now, what the next phase of your research is going to be. <laughs> next phase? Well... Was that a sensitive <laughs> question? I don't know. Um, no, it's not a sensitive question. It's, it's, it's a challenging question because I'm excited about five different things <laughs> that pull me in different directions, and um, <laughs> I was just trying to think which one, which strand to follow in the answer. Um, so there's definite. I'm a field researcher. I spend my time mostly out uh, on frozen lakes or on boats in the summer, and uh, I collect bubbles in lakes. Um, so for me, one of the most interesting questions is where are these bubbles coming from? And in, in studying several hundred lakes across the Arctic just through field work, we've seen a whole variety of emissions. Um, some lakes have very low emissions, and the lakes with the highest emissions are these lakes that are, have permafrost thawing. What we need to do, so I think one important area now to work in, is to start reconciling our field-based estimates, which translate into what we call bottom-up estimates of methane emissions, with top-down measurements, people who are measuring um, changes in the atmospheric methane concentration, the isotopes of methane in the atmosphere, and then they use um, transport models and inverse modeling to estimate how much methane is coming off the Earth's surface. So the bottom-up estimates from people who study lakes and wetlands suggest that there's more methane coming out of, of the Arctic than, the, than what the um, top-down atmospheric inverse modeling says that there is. So I'd like to work together more closely with that community to start reconciling what those differences are. And now that we've identified that permafrost emissions do have this ancient carbon signal, um, by monitoring the radiocarbon age of methane in the atmosphere, that, that 
that should be a, a sensitive signal for the release of, of permafrost carbon. Well, it's such important research. Uh, we're really glad that you're doing it, and we will be following it very closely. So Katie Walter Anthony, aquatic system, ecosystem ecologist, uh, thanks so much for doing that work, and thanks for coming on the program. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity.